the series, Behind the Curtain presents information in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the mysteries we will examine. Behind the Curtain has traveled the internet searching for mysteries, uncovered conspiracies, and to bring knowledge to our viewing audience. This is the work of our fact checker, the AI formerly known as the Red Queen, and a not so highly skilled writer. Without further ado, we now present to you, Dr. Seacats Behind the Curtain. Thank you for the mostly plagiarized introduction, Doctor. Today we will be examining scary music, please. Once upon a time, 1991 to be exact, the Walt Disney Corporation released the movie Beauty and the Beast. This tale as old as time is from Disney's renaissance, and is riddled with plot holes and questionable actions. We are told that Gaston was the villain, and that Bill and the Beast are the heroes. But, was what we were told the truth? In this video, we will examine the main player's possible motivations and actions to see if he can uncover the real villain from Beauty and the Beast. According to the book, Tale as Old as Time, The Making of Beauty and the Beast, Belle is described as a, a bibliophilic and beautiful young girl who seeks adventure and offers her own freedom to the Beast in return for her father's. In their effort to enhance the character from the original story, the filmmakers felt that Belle should be unaware of her own beauty and made her a little odd. A little odd? Really? She spits on their faces as she struts about. Little town, it's a quiet village. Every day, like the one before. Little town, full of little people. And insulting them by calling them little people, in her opening song. As the locals awake to go about their day they say hello to Belle, and she ignores them and continues her musical rant. There must be something wrong with this provincial life, she sings away ignoring the people around her and contributing nothing to the town. If you don't like it, Belle, move. Nothing is forcing you to stay, or is there? In one of the earlier versions of Beauty and the Beast, Belle makes a reference about having to move again to her father. Why is this, Belle? In the early part of the movie we see that she strolls through town complaining about her pathetic life, and is wearing a maid's dress also known as a dirndl. According to the book Insider's Guide, it's sometimes reported that the placement of the knot on the apron is an indicator of the woman's marital status. A knot tied on the woman's left side indicates that she is single. A knot tied on the right means that she is married, engaged or otherwise taken. A knot tied in the front center means that she is a maiden. And a knot tied at the back indicates that the woman is widowed. So, is there something that we aren't being told directly? Belle's father had received a head injury from one of his many, kooky, inventions. Could the malfunction be due to sabotage by Belle in order to make him forget? But forget what? It can be assumed that if they were forced to move, and that Belle was widowed, something must have happened. Is Belle an evil black widow or an unwitting sleeper agent? We know that the poor beast is mauled by a pack of wolves and later attacked by the townsfolk. What would she have to gain? The monarchy of course. After eliminating the beast, by the pitchfork wielding townsfolk, she would be free to rule as queen, unopposed. Nothing like a little regicide to get out of the staleness of provincial life. Later on Gaston was violently murdered by being tossed off the side of the castle, and almost killing the beast in the process. Talk about killing two birds with one stone. According to the official Disney villain list, it says that Gaston was the bad guy. But was he really? And this led to us to the next question. Was Gaston really as bad as Disney tells us? Let's examine what we know objectively. The entire town worships this guy, and with the exception of the nutty professor and Bell, they sing about how great he is. Sure, he acts forceful towards Bell. 
Yet no one calls him out on his behavior, not even Bell. By saying nothing to him, the town, Bell, and his friends effectively enabled his bad behavior to continue. The devil worshipping triplets never sat him down for an intervention, but instead encouraged his behavior. Sure he's vain. Ever met a famous sports figure or jock that didn't have at least a little hubris? With more scrutiny, we see that from his style of dress and clothes that Gaston was a medieval forester. These individuals were granted the exclusive right by the city or royalty to hunt and catch criminals. Forester was a title used during the medieval times. The forester usually held a position equal to a sheriff or a local law enforcer, and he could act as a barrister or arbiter. He was responsible for patrolling the woodlands on a lord or noble's property, hence the synonymous term woodward. His duties included negotiating sales of lumber and timber, stopping poachers from illegally hunting, and frequently hunting down outlaws that would take refuge in heavily wooded regions. When this occurred it was the duty of the forester to organize armed posses to capture or disperse the criminals. The pay and status of foresters were usually above average. Can we assume that Gaston was a forester? Considering he can hunt and dispense his justice as he sees fit, yes. He's an ass, but sometimes you have to act that way when catching criminals. So, here's his situation broken down to its basics. You are the local sheriff, young and handsome, and you are trying to woo the local smart girl. She's different, and none of the town's people respect her for it. You are the only person who likes her for who she is. Your best friend and confidant suggests you go off to her. Continuing from Gaston's point of view, the girl disappears for a few months with no explanation. Your would-be bride's father comes back with a crazy story of how his daughter is trapped in a castle with an ugly monster. You say to yourself, there hasn't been a ruling monarchy for ten years. Given the limited information, plus part of a magic mirror, you see a monster. Point one, as a hunter, you see this as a new challenge. Point two, as a potential suitor, this beast has captured your girl. Point three, as a forester, it's your job to rid the local area of a monster. Given limited information, and similar situation, any reasonable person could have come to the same conclusions. Any normal person would have supported Gaston, especially with the crazy enchantresses running about, turning kids into teacups and dogs into furniture at will. Now it's time to scrutinize the next suspect. Let's look at the enchantress mucking about causing problems with random people. During the narration at the beginning of the movie, an old lady walks up to a castle and asks to stay for a rose. The guy tells the old hag to go beat feet. After being denied a second time, she turns into a beautiful enchantress and the prince into a beast, and finally the narration into a movie. Now we have our plot and it's time to look at the situation objectively. First, we see this old lag goes up to an 11 year old boy. We know this because the clock and candlestick say they have been cursed for 10 years. 10 years we've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting. So an 11 year old kid, who is royalty I'd like to add, is supposed to allow an unknown woman, possible an assassin, into his castle. He should have cried, stranger danger. Called his guards and had her locked up. The rude prince was following rules of common sense. Although there were other dangers such as kidnapping for ransom, the main threat with which stranger danger campaigns are concerned is sexual abuse, especially in that time period. In recent years, the emphasis of such campaigns has shifted somewhat, in order to reflect the risk of abuse by persons known to the child. Common phrases children will hear include, don't talk to strangers, don't accept gifts from strangers. If ever approached by a stranger, tell a parent or an adult whom you trust. After following the common sense rules of stranger danger, not once but twice, he shuts the door on the old hag. In response, the old hag not only curses him, but curses the entire staff. 
The prince should have called Ramsay Bolton or Montgomery Burns and released the hounds on the switch. Now that we have looked at the major players, it's time to look at our 11-year-old prince. It's obvious this poor kid didn't have any parents, decent advisors or guards, just random servants doing their servant thing. One day you are polishing the silverware, the next day you are the silverware. This is discounting the fact the prince didn't have any outside relatives, religious figures, treaties with surrounding nations and anything else needed to run a country. Now let's look at another character roughly the same age, Lady Lyanna of House Mormont in Game of Thrones. She was leading the Mormonts since the age of 10 after the majority of her house was butchered during the Red Wedding. If someone like Lady Mormont was in charge when the old witch walked in, then the Enchantress's head and the rest of her would have been a bear's snack before you could have said, Can I stay in your? That little girl was a firecracker. Who the hell is educating this poor prince about Machiavelli, statecraft, or the local affairs? What about treaties and alliances? One minute you are working on trade deals with this nation, the next your trusted courtier is telling you the 11-year-old Prince Gout turned into a monster and the nation's chief advisor is a clock. This country is ripe for invasion. The main question should be, who's running the affairs of state? According to historical accounts, when there was a gap in authority, the church would step in to fill the power vacuum until a suitable replacement could be found. This prince was set up for failure, Game of Thrones style. Without proper guidance the prince had no chance. So now we ask ourselves, who was the real villain from Beauty and the Beast? Was it Gaston? No. He acted how any reasonable person would in the same set of circumstances. Was it the young prince? No again, because 11 year olds shouldn't be trusted with making life changing decisions. Was it Belle? It's possible since she had the most to gain. Or was it the evil enchantress? Now let's re-examine the evil enchantress's role she played. The following hypothesis hinges on the fact that all Disney movies are connected. With countless easter eggs, fan-made videos, and shared universe in video games this is more than a simple hypothesis and more likely a reliable theory. With that being said, there's significant evidence that suggests the evil enchantress and the evil queen from Snow White are one in the same. That's right, they're the same person. The enchantress and the evil queen have similar personality characteristics methods of operation, and parallel physical appearances. Both women have the ability to transform their looks and can use disguises, have an obsession with inner and outer beauty, both women can use magic, and will go to extremes to punish those they don't like. As far as physical appearances are concerned, both have nose warts on roughly the same location, bearing artistic license in a stained glass picture and the evil witch and enchantress have yellow eyes and blonde hair. Finally, both like to give away items, such as the apple and the rose. But without further evidence we can only speculate on this correlation, until that happens this conspiracy hypothesis will be rated 3 out of 5 magic bullets. While we can only guess that the true motives of the enchantress slash evil queen, we know for certain she had no reason to kill Gaston or overthrow the local ruling government. So was the real villain of the story Belle? She may have murdered her previous husband, socially engineered Gaston and the townsfolk into attacking the beast, and manipulated the prince into falling in love with her, thus elevating her social standing, but there may have been someone more dangerous lurking in the story. An individual who was pulling the strings from the start. A character so devious her murder spree has spanned hundreds of years leaving a trail of bodies in this character's wake. With plenty of evidence in the movie, one can easily assume that Belle was turned into a Manchurian candidate, or a willing assassin, in order to further this individual's lust for power while hiding in plain sight. The last suspect will be revealed in part 2, of Beauty and the Beast, the real villain. But what do I know, I'm just a cat.